fight your battles Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Yeah Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Come on church sing this out Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Jehovah Jireh meets your needs Jehovah Rapha heal your body Jehovah Shalom be your peace Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Jehovah Nisi fight your battles Jehovah Jireh meets your needs Shut
what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We see you break down every wall. Oh, watch the fall. this place David proclaimed in you alone I put my hope that means my longing God is for you alone so when we come in here and we lift our voices and we sing these songs we're singing because he alone is worthy of our praise listen to Deuteronomy he alone is your God the only one who is worthy of your praise the one who has done these mighty miracles that you have seen with your own eyes we have heard of what our God has done yesterday today and forever. Let's worship the one who is worthy. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and i will sing of your goodness forevermore and worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name if you believe it church let's tell him he's worthy with all our heart and all our soul let's worship him My shame is gone I stand amazed In your love undeniable Your grace goes on and on And I will sing Of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name Jesus the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name Jesus you alone are worthy God you are worthy 
worthy of all our praise now be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name
he's just that good. He will never fail. you with our actions we want to glorify you with our words and everything that we have so lord would our bodies be an outburst of praise god lord change us renew us and lord prepare us even today for the word to come lord in jesus name amen 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 church go ahead and take your seats if you got your bibles we can open up to Ruth chapter 1 and also put your finger in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, Pastor Chet uh, um, is going to be finishing up a couple of more studies in the book of Ruth. He's actually, I'm really looking forward to the studies he's going to do. He's going to be doing a study of, of pro the prophetic side of Ruth and then also looking at Ruth through Jesus. And both of those are going to be amazing studies. But again, let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, again, we do thank you for your love, your goodness, and your grace for each and every one of us. And Lord, I believe you have a special word for us tonight from your heart to our hearts, Lord. As Pastor Dennis was praying, it, it, all of those things he was praying, Lord, are part of the message. And so obviously, you're speaking. You're speaking to us. And I, I pray and ask, would you give us ears to hear what your spirit would say as you would minister to us? Lord, again, your word tells us <laughs> if we lack wisdom, Lord, you will give it abundantly if we ask. So we ask for you to give us that wisdom from above, uh, Lord, that we would understand what you want to speak and minister to our hearts. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. 
Amen, amen, amen. In, in going through the book of Ruth again, it's a, it's a study that I absolutely love. I've been loving Pastor Chet as he's going through there. But there in chapter one, we see a guy by the name of Elimelech, and Elimelech marries a woman named Naomi. And then uh, they have a couple of kids, but then they decide to head out of Bethlehem, out of Israel, and go to Moab, and there kind of continue their family. But while they're there in Moab, Elimelech dies. So Naomi has her husband, and her her husband dies. Listen, uh, my dad just died a couple of months ago and stuff, and and I know for my mom, that's kind of a heavy thing. I I have friends who have lost a spouse, and that's a difficult thing to, to walk through and to navigate. But not only did her husband die, but then both of her sons pass away. And then she's sitting there, and if a famine hits the land, and she's trying to figure out, what do I do? What do I, have? Where do I go from here? Hey, I hear that, there's, that, that the Lord has visited his people back in Bethlehem with bread, uh, so I'm going to head back there. And she's got her two uh, daughters-in-laws who married her boys, and um, you know they kind of wanted to go, but she's kind of shooing them, no, 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 you guys stay here. And they kind of want to go, she's shooing them back, and she says, listen, Man, when I got here, I had a lot, but now I've got almost nothing. And there's nothing waiting for me back there except pain and suffering per se. And, and, and you guys go back to your families. Don't come with me. So Orpah, she goes back, but the Bible says that Ruth, she clung to Naomi. She clung to Naomi, and then she said those words, and again, that we just love, you know, hey, where you go, I'm going to go. Your God's going to be my God. Your people are my people. Where you die is where I want to die. And these incredible words by Ruth. And so Naomi, kind of, they head back. And we're going to pick it up there in in verse 19 of chapter 1. And it says this. It says, Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? And I, I want to stop for just a moment. Because, listen... All of the city, it says, was excited about Naomi. Naomi had to be one of these people who had a personality kind of like Adonis, just very exciting and very joyful. And and man, you just want to be around her. And and she had this infectious way about her. Listen, if she didn't, I'm going to tell you, the whole city wouldn't be that excited. I lived on an island in a very small town. Everyone knew everyone. And I'm telling you what, there were some people when I saw them, I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want to talk to you. You know, you walk away. But there were other people, hey, Pat, let's get together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why? Because that person is such an amazing person. I want to be around them. Listen, that is who Naomi was when she left Bethlehem. So all the city was excited because, oh my gosh, Naomi, you know, it's kind of like the Hello Dolly, if you guys, the older people like that movie and stuff. You know, when Dolly comes back, hey, it's Dolly. You know, I like old movies. Anyways, but, but it's kind of like that type of thing was going on here in, in Bethlehem. But listen to what Naomi says. She says, don't call me Naomi. Now, Naomi, the word means pleasant. It means pleasant. But she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter, bitter. Listen what she says. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She says, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home empty again. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord, listen what she said. The Lord has testified against me. The Almighty has afflicted me. Listen, Naomi, that person that you guys remember, she's no longer in existence. I'm not that person. Who I am now as I come back, I am bitter. Uh, I've been devastated. These things that have happened to me within my life, all of these disappointments. And yet it goes to where Naomi is almost like I'm blaming God. The Almighty has afflicted me. He has testified against me. Have you ever done that within your own heart, within your life, where something has happened within your life and you begin to, like, blame God, blame God? The disappointments in life. Why do we go through disappointments? 
Why do we have to go through trials? I think sometimes we think that God enjoys watching us suffer. Um, well, you know, or we think that it's, it's punishment for our past sins. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes the enemy takes me to that place where when there's a trial going on or tribulations or the disappointments, I think that God is standing there with a two by four, like almost like waiting for me. Like, yeah, yeah, now I'll get pat. Whap, you know, but, but that, that's not the father. That, that's the enemy that would be doing that. But sometimes we think that's what it's like. And yet, Oftentimes, it's like, man, why can't everything just be wonderful? Why do I have to experience the trials within my life? And again, listen, these are the type of trials that it's not the, uh, listen, I don't have any ice cream type trial. There's a little backstory with that. When me and my wife first got married, we actually were going to go do a mission trip for our first year of our marriage. And then the, the organization said, listen, you're getting married. You're doing this wouldn't be the greatest of things. So, you know, they said, you know, don't do that. In fact, even the Bible, you know, it says, hey, when you first get married, enjoy each other before you, you, you go out. But we had a whole lot of nothing. And then we had our first child. Then we had our second child. But we were living up in Northern California and that whole story. I, I remember I, I drove up to Grass Valley, which is up kind of up by Sacramento and then up in the foothills. And I drove up there looking for, you know, there's a pastor that I knew was pastoring a church. And he had asked me, hey, come on up here, Pat. You, got, you would love it up here. So I drive up on a weekend and I'm looking for, I found a job and I found a house. I go back, tell Mary, we got a job, got a house. Let's pack up and let's go. So we pack up. We leave Southern California. We drive up to Northern California. When I get there, we're at the pastor's house. And, and I call the guy that had said that he had a house for us. And then he says, oh, you know what? That, that, I give that house away. We don't, I don't have a house anymore. Oh, okay. And, and then I call the guy that offered me a job. And he says, you know, Pat, that job, I don't have it anymore. So I'm sitting in the pastor's house. And, you know, my wife, she's such a blessing. Anyways, I'm sitting there. I'm like, yeah, Mary. It's a, God's got it all. But then the next morning, there was a, uh, a little men's gathering like we had this last Saturday and stuff. And I remember going there, and there was a guy there, and he says, oh, hey, I got a house. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But, man, if you want it, it's open. You can move in today. I'm like, cool. And then I ran into another guy, and he, was, he offered me a job and stuff. And, but the job was like paying like five bucks an hour. Listen, at the time, we had nothing. And my mom comes up, because we just had our uh, son born, our first son. And my mom comes up, and I remember she's looking around like, you guys don't even have a TV. Well, yeah, mom, we don't have a TV, so what? And she opens the refrigerator and the freezer. When she opens the freezer, you don't have ice cream. You know, and it's kind of like that was her gauge of, you know, whether we're doing okay or not if we had ice cream in the freezer. So this is not that kind of a trial, this is the kind of trial where, you know what, I don't have money for food. Or this is the, my husband just left me trial. Or the doctor just told me I got cancer trial. Why do we go through these trials? Listen, Romans 5 tells us this, uh, 1 through 4. Um, it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, if we have been justified by faith, and justified is just as if we have not sinned, and that's us turning our lives over to the Lord, allowing him to wash us, to cleanse us, to forgive us of all our sins. That's what God wants to do with each and every one. But if we have been justified by faith, we should have peace with God. And maybe tonight, if you're sitting and you don't have that peace, uh, maybe we need to reconnect our spiritual gauge with the Lord of what he is speaking to our hearts. But he says, we have peace through God, uh, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have, and I love this, access by faith into his grace in which we stand. Listen, we have access by faith, by believing in him, into that grace. That grace is God's unmerited favor which he gives to us and that is how we stand uh, again the book of titus says um th there that uh um it's not by works of righteousness that we've done but it's according to his mercy that he saved us so it's not our good works that gets us into heaven or or that we stand in but it's by faith in jesus christ that's what we stand in but then he goes on to say there are not only that but we also glory in tribulation Paul, why do we glory in tribulation? And he tells us, knowing that tribulation, it's going to produce something within our lives. 
What does tribulation produce? Perseverance. Perseverance is to persist in spite of difficulties. And perseverance produces character, a reputation or moral excellence. And character produces hope within our lives. Listen, church, all of us have things that happen within our lives that affect us. They, they do. They affect us. I remember when I was in high school, I was in gymnastics, and I did the high bar, and I flew off the bar and landed and snapped my knee in half, so I had to, they had to go in and do kind of a couple of different surgeries. I mean, listen, that affected me. It did. It affected me, you know, and stuff. And I remember, because all I wanted to do was kind of compete in the CIF and stuff, and I eventually, you know, got back on. I got a cast on my leg, and I'm still swinging because I wanted my, you know, calluses to stay on there and stuff. But, but, but again, it affected me. It affects me. Even to this day, if I get on my knees, my, my knee will start kind of going numb and stuff like that. But it affected me. But if I allow, if I allow these things not just to affect me, but to infect me, What's an infection? An infection is something that gets underneath the skin and it starts destroying from the inside out. It starts killing us. That's what that infection will do. And I have found sometimes when I'm talking to people, it's not only that they've had things going that they've been affected by, but they're infected. There was a guy that I used to know, and, and when I first met him, he would always come up, and he always had a, a T-shirt on, and it was a picture of his wife who had passed away. And I remember I was trying to kind of minister to this guy, minister to this guy, and I'm just realizing that he had, he had told me that he'd been, his wife had passed away seven years ago. He had been sleeping on his couch because he couldn't sleep in his bed. And I'm like, man, we, we need to move on because I, I told him, you, you're infected by this. You can't move on. You can't go anywhere. And then I, there was another guy that I knew and his wife had passed away. And he actually walked through that in such a healthy way. So I kind of connected the dots. I said, hey, could you come and minister to this guy? And eventually, it's like God started breaking through and doing that ministry that this guy needed. And, and then he realized that, you know what? I can move on in my life. But these things that happen, they, within us, within all of us, they either affect us or they infect us. And if they infect us, it's going to do radically unhealthy things with all of us. Uh, on Saturday, we had Bill Buffington here. And if you guys um, missed it, you can go online and, and listen. It was a great word that he gave us. But he was talking out of there at 2 Timothy 2, 3, where it says, Therefore, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he was just walking through and talking about how we have to endure. Again, the minute we accept the Lord, there's an enemy out there who wants to destroy us. And he's going to come after us. And he, and he doesn't stop. He doesn't take a holiday. doesn't take vacation and stuff. But we must endure. And we're going to have to endure those things. In fact, Jesus said, if you live godly, you're going to suffer. There's going to be pure persecution that is a part of that within our lives. But again, there's a lot of us. We've had a lot of disappointment. One of the persons in the Bible that I look at and I love, he's one of my heroes there, is a guy by the name of David. And I want to just look at his life for just a moment uh, there. So if you can turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20. But when we think about David and where he started, remember he was a very young boy. Uh, he was watching his dad's sheep. And at that time, Saul was the king, but God had rejected Saul. And Samuel was the prophet. And he told Samuel, hey, I want you to go to the sons of Jesse. And there you anoint the one that I tell you to anoint. And he is going to become king. So Samuel makes his way to, to Bethlehem. And he goes to Jesse's house. And he says, hey, Jesse, I need to see your kids, will you bring your kids out? So he brought them out from the oldest first and one by one. And the first one comes out and Samuel looks, he says, man, this is a good looking guy. Man, this guy looks like king material and stuff, a king in the making. And yet, do you remember what God said to Samuel? He said, man looks at the outside, but God looks at 
the heart. Because it's all about what's going on inside of us that God is really, he cares about and he's looking at. And yet for us, those are things that we oftentimes really struggle with as the exterior and, and, and all of that, the, those kind of things. Listen, the world in which we live in, it's all about the, the, the exterior. I had a good friend and <clears throat> he was from Missouri, but uh, he was at, when I was pastoring up in uh, Washington State, uh, on the little island that we were at up there. But he was at our church, and the first time he went down to Las Vegas for a trade show. And he's walking around. I remember him calling me that night. He goes, oh, my gosh, Pat, I'm walking around seeing all this stuff, and it's just incredible. It's amazing. And looking at it like there's these big, huge rocks. But then I went up, and I realized it, it, it's fake. It's phony. It's, it's, it's like styrofoam. It's not even real. But it's, it has this appearance of like something that was real. And I remember when he was telling me, like, wow, well, that is such a concept of the world in which we live. But listen, especially ladies, Peter says the same thing to us, to you ladies, especially there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. He says this. He says, don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging a hair, wearing a gold, putting on a fine apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Very precious. It's, it's like Peter is coming to you and saying, hey, guys, don't be so concerned about the outside, but be more concerned about the inside. My wife one time was um, doing a little study with some ladies, and she was talking about how, you know, when you go to the grocery store and it's all the magazines, and, and it used to be all of the, 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 the supermodels, the supermodels, the supermodels, and everyone is looking at supermodels and going, oh, my gosh, that's what I want to be, that's what I want to be. But my wife was saying, you know, very few women on the planet actually have the genetic engineering to be a supermodel and those nowadays that do it's usually medically enhanced but every single woman on the planet has the ability to be one of God's supermodels because God's supermodel has nothing to do with the exterior it has to do with the interior and if God gets a hold of the interior then God will do something radically precious you know go back to Naomi again that Naomi was no longer Naomi she was Mara and she said that I am just bitter because I feel like God is against me listen when bitterness is going on in here that's what's going to ooze out of the life but when it's something that's precious because God is working through and in your heart and life. That's what's going to be emanating out from the life. But again, you know, uh, man looks at the outward, but God looks at the heart. So he has all seven of his sons pass by, and Samuel's looking like, okay, nope. God said, nope, nope, nope. And finally Samuel just sit back, and all seven of them go by, and God says, nope, not one of these. And he stops and like, okay, Lord, what's going on here? You told me to come anoint. He said, do you have any more kids? Well, I got the young one that's out, the little kid, and he's out watching the sheep. And he says, well, call him and bring him in. So they call David. They bring him in. Samuel anoints him with the oil and, you know, prays over him. But, you know, honestly, I don't believe that, that David really knew. The brothers all knew exactly what was really going on. In fact, I'm sure when Samuel was done, David goes, well, my job is to take care of the sheep. And he went back to taking care of the sheep because uh, that, that's what he was doing and stuff. But then there was this whole battle, you know, with the Philistines and Goliath coming out and, you know, defiling the armies of the Philistines and saying, you send me a man, send me a man, send me a man. And they were all scared and afraid. But you know what I love about it? Because remember what it said about Saul? Saul was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. It should have been Saul that went out. But David comes by and he's visiting and he sees this guy come out. And he's like, wait, who is this guy that's defiling the armies of the Lord? Man, I'll go after him. I'll go get him and stuff. And they got to Saul and they go, okay, David, go ahead. And here, put on my armor. And David goes, no, 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 no. I'm just going out with my sling and a couple of rocks and I'm going to take this guy out. And I love it because it said David ran at Goliath. Takes the rock out, puts it in his sling. Wacko. And it hits him in the temple. Goliath falls down. Man, he knocks him out. David runs and grabs his sword from his sheath, and David cuts off his head. And then he grabs his head, and he's running around, because later on it says David still had the head of Goliath in his hand after the battle. And he's running around chasing him. David, in one moment, becomes the national hero of all of Israel. 
Everyone knew David. They're, they're, they start singing songs about David. Man, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. David even marries the king's daughter. He's the son-in-law of the king. He's living in the palace. This is what's going on in David's life. But Saul started having these kind of issues. The, the scripture says that an evil spirit came upon him or something. And so they go, hey, let's find a guy or somebody to come in and play music and to kind of soothe the savage beast. And they go, hey, David plays really well. So they bring David in, and he's sitting there playing the music, and, you know, all of a sudden the temperature goes down. Listen, I don't know, ladies, uh, if you've ever tried this, but I know my wife does this all the time. I'll come home, uh, especially before when I used to work construction, and I'd be, you know, the, the temperature in the house would rise when I got home and stuff. Next thing I know, he'll, Fernando Ortega, be playing on the, the stereo. You know, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. And it's like, yes, yes. And all of a sudden, ah, things calm back down. But David's sitting there playing. But then Saul starts really eyeing him. And then Saul grabs a spear and he throws it at him to try to kill him. And this didn't happen just once, but it happened a few times. And so at this time in David's life, he really believes that that Saul is out to kill him. And David is just not quite sure of what he wants to do. Again, it's one thing to um, get blamed for something that you did wrong. It's another thing when you don't know that you've done anything wrong or you've not done anything wrong, and it seems like you're getting blamed for that, you know? Back in your dating days, did you ever like go out with someone that you really wanted to go out to and you wanted to make sure it was just this really special night and, and, and uh, you wanted to say everything right, but then you notice as it's going along, like the mood just like radically changed and it's like, uh-oh, what I do? I said something and then you play all these gymnastics in your head and what I do? Oh, 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 and then the next thing you know, you're kind of a mess. That's how David was at this time in his life. He was an emotional mess. He was a mess. But let's pick it up. Uh, uh, Saul had a son named Jonathan. Sorry, let me finish the story. And Jonathan and David were really close friends, uh, and they had these little packs together of, of them, you know, watching out for each other and looking out. But that was Jonathan's son. But David feels like Saul is trying to kill him, so him and Jonathan kind of come up with this plan. Look at it in um, um, 1 Samuel 20. We're going to pick it up in verse 18. It says, Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow's the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. And when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone Ezel. And Ezel means the stone of departure. And then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. And there I will send a lad saying, go find the arrows. And if I expressly say to the lad, look, the arrows are on this side of you, then get them and come. As the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. But if I say thus to the, the man, look, the arrows are beyond you. Go your way for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you have and I have spoken of, indeed, the Lord be between me and you forever. Again, Jonathan comes up with a plan of how to let David know if Saul is mad uh, and he's got to flee or if there's safety and he can come back without anyone else knowing. So they kind of hatch this plan without saying a word. David's going to go and they're going to do this. So then, verse 24, then David hid in the field. When the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat at the feast. Now the king sat on his seat as at other times, on a seat by the wall, and Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. Abner was the head of the army of Israel. Uh, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He's unclean. Surely uh, he's unclean. And it happened the next day, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, well, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered Saul, well, David earnestly asked permission of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. Now, if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore, he's not come to the king's uh, table. Um, so anyways, while David's there at the Stony Zelly, Jonathan goes up to where Saul is uh, and acts like nothing happened. And then when Saul asks where David was, he gives an answer that he feels like Saul should understand. It should be a good thing. But let's see what happens. Verse 30, then Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan. 
And he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. That's his wife he's talking about. Anyways, <laughs> do, you, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now, therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. Listen, Saul sees that Jonathan and David have made a pact and they respect each other more than Jonathan actually respects his own dad. And yet that makes Saul mad. Uh, so mad that Saul tries to kill his own son. Listen, pride is such an amazing thing. Saul tries to say that he's trying to protect Jonathan and Jonathan's kingdom, but then tries to kill the one he says he's trying to protect. Well, what's going on? Well, Saul knows that David is the one who's anointed. Everyone knew that he was the one anointed to be the king. And every time he thinks about David, it reminds him of his own disobedience and what he had lost. Samuel came to Saul when he first became king and said, the Lord wants you to go and to wipe out the Amalekites and utterly destroy everything there. So Saul goes out and does battle with the Amalekites, but he doesn't utterly destroy everything. He brings back the best of the sheep and the flocks and the herds because he's thinking, hey, you know, we can offer this to the Lord. And he also brings the king back. And at that time, Samuel came to Saul and said, Saul, listen, uh, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. Can I tell you, there's been times in my life where I read God's word and God's word says, Pat, you go forgive. Because if you don't go forgive, then I'm not going to forgive you. That's what his word would tell us there in the Gospels. And, and I, for myself, I'm like, well, how about I, I go to Africa and, and build a church? Or how about I go to, I want to go and, and sacrifice rather than simply obeying what God did. It reminds me of Naaman, Naaman the Syrian, who was a leper. And, and he goes to the prophet and, and, and he, you know, because he, uh, he had a little girl that they had captured from Israel. And this little girl's faith looked at Naaman, who had leprosy, and, but he was the general of the army of the Syrians, and she looked at him and says, oh, if Naaman would just go to the prophet, he would heal you of his leprosy. And Naaman heard that, and he's like, hey, he goes to the king. And the, so the king sends a letter to the king of Israel. Hey, I'm going to send you to this guy. You need to heal him of his leprosy. And the king's like, are you kidding me? I'm not God. I can't heal this guy. But he goes, Naaman goes to him, and, and, and Elijah says, send him to me. So then he goes to Elijah, and Elijah looks at him and says, he, he doesn't even come out and, and talk to him. He just sends his servant out and go, go tell him to dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman is like this proud guy. And he's like, are you kidding me? The rivers in, you know, in Damascus are way cleaner and way better. Why would I go dip in the Jordan, that dirty, yucky river and stuff? And he starts marching off. And his, his, his servant's kind of like, Hey, master, stop, stop, stop. Listen, if he had asked you to do some great thing, you would have gladly gone and done it. But how about just simply going and doing what he said? And Naaman finally went and did what he said and dipped in the river seven times, and he was made clean. He was cleansed of his, of his leprosy. But again, Saul had rejected the Lord. And then Samuel came to him again, and, and, and he did something that God had said not to do. And, and Saul wanted Samuel to go with him. And Samuel said, no, I'm not going to go. And he turns around, and Saul grabbed his, his jacket, and he ripped it. And Samuel turned around and said, as you rip my jacket, God is going to rip the kingdom from you and give it to one who's better than you. But Saul was still hanging on with everything that he had. And David was a reminder of that. But let's pick it up there in verse 34. It says, Then Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger, ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had treated him shamefully. So it was in the morning that Jonathan went out to the field at the appointed time with David, and a little lad was with him. And he said to his lad, now run and find the arrow which, which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot the arrow beyond him. And the lad had come to the place where the arrow was, which Jonathan had shot. Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, is not the arrow beyond you? 
And Jonathan cried out after the lad, make haste, hurry, do not delay. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows, came back to his master. But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, go carry them to the city. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose from the place towards the south and he fell, he fell on, on, on his face to the ground and bowed down three times and they kissed one another and they wept together. But David the more so. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. Again, here we see David and he's sitting there waiting by the stone as well for three days, not knowing what might happen. David's life was in the hands of another. And as he sat there wondering by this stone, what is going to happen? Then he sees Jonathan coming and he sees Jonathan approaching with a young lad. He sees Jonathan takes the bow and takes the arrow. And then he watches as Jonathan takes one of the arrows, pulls that arrow back and lets that arrow fly. David knows, listen, if it falls short, everything's going to be all right. I can go back to my palace house. I can go back to my, I can stay here in the kingdom. But if the arrow goes long, I'm going to turn into a fugitive. I'm going to turn into a man that must flee for his life. And as David sat there and watched that arrow, there was nothing he could say, nothing he could do, nothing he could change to make that arrow do what he wanted it to do. He was at the mercy of another. And as he watched that arrow fly through the sky and over the rock, he knew his life would never be the same, that he would be a man on the run. He would no longer live in the palace, but in caves and in the wilderness. And yet, I believe that David also believed that God was working on him because that's what Romans tells us. When things like this happen to us, God is doing a work within our heart life because God wanted to make a man after his own heart, David, into this great king and great leader. Man, have you ever been in a place like that where someone else is kind of controlling your destiny? Someone else is calling the shots about your life and there's nothing you can say, nothing you can do, nothing to change to help influence their decision. You're just waiting for someone else to make the decisions that will impact your future. I don't know about you, but I know me. I'm kind of a control freak, so I don't like to not be in control. And when someone else is in control, that worry and all of those things that happen within my life. Maybe at some point within your life, you had a boss come up and shoot that arrow. Hey, you know what? You're fired. You're no longer working here. Or, hey, you know what? Yeah, we're relocating you somewhere that you don't want to go. Though Those arrows of change that happen with all of us, someone else shooting those arrows, and, and then your destiny is changed. Listen, I, I got actually six sisters, but my sister who's just below me, she was over at a friend helping her, and she was up on a small little stepladder painting a ceiling for this lady. And as she was there, she slipped, fell back, hit her head. Her brain started hemorrhaging. Um, she ended up in a coma for about five months. In the coma, um, you know, they'd messed up with the IV, but they were trying to save her life here, and so they had to amputate part of her arm. Uh, there and stuff. But, but listen, my sister, she, she finally came out of it a couple of years of rehab and stuff. She will never be who she was. Even her kids said, you know what? Our mom's gone, that kind of thing. But you think about those arrows that were shot, that fly out, that, that other people are maybe controlling, that other things or a circumstance that you have absolutely no control over. Let me tell you something about my sister. Her short-term memory is not very good, but her long-term memory is, and she was in love with Jesus and still is to this day because of that. So anyways, she, yeah, she's great. She always calls up. She can get a little confused with some of the scriptures and things like this and stuff, and I keep telling her, Linda, get out of the Old Testament. Don't go there. You, you always get, you always get, gonna stay in the New Testament. Stay with Jesus' words and stuff. But anyway, she, she, she loves the Lord and stuff. But, but when those things happen, when someone else is doing that, I think, I think about Moses there and, and he was raised in the palace. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter, he was raised in the palace there with Pharaoh's daughter. And then at some time around 40 years old, uh, he sees an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite slave. And he looks this way, looks that way, and he goes out and he kills the Egyptian, then buries him in the sand. And he thinks nobody saw it. But then the next day, they realize, hey, no, they, they did see that. And then Moses goes and he ends up in the wilderness. But God was producing something within his life. God was doing a work. 
He was doing that work of, of perseverance, of character, and of hope. I know some of you who are here probably still remember this day. I uh, remember the morning that Pastor Rob called me and said, hey, Pastor Steve just passed away. He was in the hospital and he died. And I'm thinking, wow, talk about some arrows of change that might happen. What's going to happen? What's going to go on? And, and I remember when we were driving down there just kind of like, wow, Lord, what is it that you're doing? What is it you're doing? But listen, these things that happen to us again, is it going to allow me or make me bitter, make me blame God, make me get mad at God? Or are these things going to make me understand that, that maybe I don't always understand, but God is doing a work in and through my heart and in and through my life? Because here in this story, Naomi, her husband dies. That's an arrow of change. Then both her sons die, more arrows of change. And for a season, she becomes bitter, blaming God for what's transpired. But then something happened with Naomi. It's a lot like what happened with Joseph. If you remember Joseph, uh, he was Jacob's 11th son. Jacob favored him a lot and gave him like this coat and, and stuff that, that all his brothers were jealous of. But then he started, Jake, Joseph started having these dreams that his brother and mom and dad were all bowing down to him and stuff. And, and his brothers hated him for it. Joseph, or Jacob finally says, hey, Joseph, why don't you go off to your brothers, go see where they're at. And as Joseph is far off, they see him and they're like, here comes that dreamer. And, and the closer he gets, the madder they get, so mad that they want to take him and they want to kill him. So they throw him in a pit and they're going to kill him and stuff. But then a couple of guys say, well, what, what, let's not kill him. Let's make some money on him. And there's these slave traders go by, they sell him off, they get some money there. Joseph goes and he's sold off into to slavery in Egypt and he's there at Potiphar's house. And there at Potiphar's house, he's trying to honor God with his action and attitudes and everything. And he gets lifted up and lifted up. And, and then Potiphar, uh, he puts him in charge of everything. So he's running the house. But Potiphar's wife, you know, she starts looking at him and doing the winky thing like, hey, you know, come on. And then lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And he's like, no, I'm not going to disobey God. Finally, one day she grabs his clothes and rips them and he runs out the door naked. And then she gets mad. So she cries out rape. And then hubby gets home and then throws Joseph in prison. Now, Joseph is in prison and he's there. And, but he's just serving and doing things. And there was a butler and a, a baker that ended up in there that were working for Pharaoh. And they both had a dream, and Joseph interprets their dreams. And the, the baker, you know, hey, you're going to die, butler. Hey, you're going to get put back, into, back by your master's side. And then that exact same thing happened. And then years later, Pharaoh has a dream. And then they couldn't get anyone to interpret the dream. And finally, the butler says, hey, I remember this guy there. And uh, he interpreted our dream for us. And, and so they, they go and they pull Joseph out, and Joseph interprets the dream. And then Joseph goes from slavery up to back into, you know, like in the palace, kind of running Egypt. But Pharaoh gives him a wife of one of the priests, and Joseph begins to have kids. And the first kid he has, his name is Manasseh. Manasseh means God has made me forget. God has, now I don't know why you would name your kid God has made you forget if you really wanted to forget, but uh, he made him, God has made, because every time you call a kid, it's like God has made me forget. But I have to look at it as something like, it was just so precious. God, yes, God has allowed me to forget. People, can I tell you, God can help you to forget the pain, the hurt, the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations, all of those things. But then he has another son, and that son's name is Ephraim. And Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of affliction. God has made me fruitful in the land of affliction. Church, can I tell you, that's what God wants to do with each and every one of our hearts. He wants to make us fruitful in the land of our affliction. Where when these trials, when the tribulations, when the disappointments in life happen, that we're holding on to Jesus. Listen, as Paul said there in Acts chapter 20, he's talking to the, the leaders of Ephesus. He says, see now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the spirit testifies in every city saying, chains and tribulations await me. So he's saying, I'm going to Jerusalem, but every time I get anywhere and they do a little prayer meeting for me, they say, hey, dude, man, you're, when you go to Jerusalem, there's chains and there's tribulation waiting you. 
But then he says this, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of grace. That good news that God sent his son to come to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins, that we might be washed and cleansed, that we might be justified just as if we've never sinned. That's how he sees us. Listen, I don't see myself that, but that's how he sees us. That is our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, people, when the trials and tribulations come, God wants to make us fruitful in the land of affliction. And that's us putting our eyes on him and looking to him, allowing him to do that work within our hearts and our lives. Let's pray. Father, again, we do thank you so much for your word. I thank you even as Pastor Dennis came out and started, Lord, speaking of these very same things, that some of us are wrestling with bitterness and, and, and situations that we, we just were struggling with. And yet, Lord, that's why you went to the cross. That's why you died on the cross, so that we might experience that forgiveness and grace. God, that you can come into the midst of that affliction and bring about hope and peace and joy. And so, Lord, I pray for the body tonight, for each and every one of us here, especially, Lord, for those who are struggling in their heart where they've allowed that bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, Lord, to, to, to infect. Lord, you died for that infection. You died to set us free. So, God, would you touch us? Would you wash us? Would you cleanse us, Lord? And you simply ask like you asked Naaman, just simply dip in me, wash in me, and let me run my blood over you and, and cover all your sin. I died for your shame, your guilt, all of that. Now you can experience forgiveness, goodness, and grace. So, Lord, help us to hold on to you. Hope, help us, Lord, as your word says, to lift our eyes because you are where our help comes from and that you would help walk us through all of these things. So be with us, touch us, and strengthen us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. All God's people agree by saying amen. 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 Let's all stand as we close in song.